I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade. Cue the music. This drunken little German monk is intoxicated with himself. Sober him. Lighten up, Francis. <laughs> I'm Ryan, and this is the Lutheran Lemonade Podcast, a weekly podcast where we sit down, we grab a cold brew, and we talk about theology. If you know me from YouTube at 1517 Films, and you know that this is brand new, and you're going to have to hop on over to soundcloud.com backslash Lutheran Lemonade. If you know me from SoundCloud, I encourage you to find me at YouTube at 1517 Films. Now, this is a weekly podcast, as I said, where we sit down, we grab a brew, and we talk about theology. Now, why on earth? Why on earth did I take the name Lutheran Lemonade? I could have just called it the 1517 Podcast. Well, that's boring. And this is going to be a bit different from my traditional YouTube channel. This is going to be a bit more intimate, just sitting down. For those of you listening in on SoundCloud, just the sound of my voice. And the knowledge that I have an ice-cold beer on the table, and I'm going to be taking a sip here or there, and we're going to be talking about theology one-on-one. Now, in the Lutheran tradition... uh, Good, solid theological conversation is often discussed at a table, hence the reason I'm at my kitchen table, not in my living room where I normally film my YouTube videos. Lutheran theology, according to our heritage and our history, is really, really rich and robust and oftentimes spoken at the table over a beer. Now, that might bother some people, and that's okay. You see, The consumption of alcohol is a freedom that Christians have, but not one that they have to indulge, and certainly not one that they have to avoid. Now, I've chosen the catchphrase to gladden the heart of man to be the theme of this podcast, just as the theme of my YouTube videos is contending for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. The theme for the podcast is to make glad the heart of man. Now that comes to us from Psalm 104 verse 15, where it is clearly stated that wine, fermented fruit of the vine, is a glorious gift of God, listed amongst all the other blessings that God bestows upon mankind, given for the sole purpose to make glad the heart of man. And when I was looking at that verse, when I was thinking about wine. And when I was thinking about especially the reading from this previous Sunday, the wedding at Cana and Jesus turning water into wine, it struck me this is a phenomenal idea for a podcast, which is why this first episode is about the wedding at Cana. Now, I'm sorry, I just realized I'm not staring at my camera, which is going to be weird for the people who watch this on YouTube, but that's okay. Now, the wedding at Cana is 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 such a, a beautiful account of the first miracle of Christ, the first sign that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God, the manifestation of his power, his divine power, but in human flesh, that he turned water into wine. Now, this is something that Jesus does regardless. Jesus turns water into wine when it falls from the sky when it lands in the vineyards and goes through to the soil, to the roots, to the vine, to the branch, to the grape. And the labor of man that we were designed for to work the garden that turns those grapes into wine. Now, Protestants who don't consume alcohol are going to be thrown. Oh, 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 it meant grape juice. I could do an exhaustive search for Welch's in the Bible. I'm not going to find it. Look, in, in the, the, the first century and, and the centuries B.C. before that, there was no fermentation technology. You pressed the grapes, you had grape juice, and very quickly it fermented. And this was actually a blessing to humanity in that the alcohol content of the wine made sterile the water that it was oftentimes mixed with. And so and they drank wine like we drink water. And I do want to start this off, since we're going to be talking about wine, we're going to be talking about the wedding at Cana, I want to ask a couple of questions. When the disciples were in the upper room, 
on the day of Pentecost at nine o'clock in the morning, and the Holy Spirit descended and tongues of fire appeared upon their head, and they started speaking in foreign languages. And the people said, they're drunk. My question to the Protestants is, how much grape juice would they have to consume, physically consume, before they could become intoxicated? If it were indeed grape juice. Or, or the Christians in the city of Corinth who Paul scolded for abusing the sacrament of the altar and telling them, you're getting drunk. And then it's not the Lord's Supper. How much, how much grape juice were they consuming to get drunk? during the Lord's Supper in Corinth, or, or in the Garden of Gethsemane when the disciples fell asleep after the five cups of grape juice during the Passover? And why, getting back to the wedding at Cana, why was it referred to as good wine? What is their cheap grape juice? Oh, 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 normally, normally they serve, you know, the Welch's first, and when everyone has had their fill of the Welch's, then they bring out the Aldi's brand, the Great Value brand, but you have saved the Welch's for last. Look, so Jesus at the wedding at Cana turns water into wine, and he, it, 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 what it confesses about who he is and what it, what it shadows in the future, this is great, and then tying it all back to that, that, that verse from Psalms where it says that wine is given to make glad the heart of man. So let's turn our attention to the scriptures. We're in the Gospel of John, the second chapter, beginning at the first verse. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rite of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, Draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. That was ending at verse 11. Now, there's so much, so much going on here. Uh, and I think we should read, especially from John's gospel, the whole of scripture, but from John's gospel especially, under the context of what he would say later in his gospel, these things are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. This account of Jesus turning water into wine is written that we may believe that he is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, earlier I had said that Jesus turns water into wine all the time. All the time when it rains on the field and the roots soak up that water from the soil and the vine takes it and grows grapes, and then man, doing what he was designed to do to work the field, turns it into wine. Jesus just skipped all those steps, didn't he? He just turned it into wine, and there was no hocus-pocus, ooh, there was just fill these jars with water, bring it to the master of the wedding. And now, on Pastor Will Whedon's um, regular daily podcast that I encourage you to listen to, The Word of the Lord Endures, or the word endures, uh, definitely check that out. He points out from these verses, and I think it's brilliant, and I share it with you again. It was the lowliest of the low that witnessed the miracle. It was the servants who filled the jars with water at Jesus' command. And it was the servants who brought the water to the master. The master, the head of the party, didn't know. He just knew he was drinking the best wine he had ever drank in his entire life. God 
Jesus shows his glory, manifests his glory to the lowly. Now we can think back to his birth when it was shepherds hiding in the caves at night, keeping watch over their flocks, sheep probably in Bethlehem for the slaughter, these lowest of the low that first heard that gospel message from the angel that witnessed the glory of the heavens being torn asunder and the angel singing glory to God in the highest. It was to the lowest of the low that the beauty of God's miracle was revealed. It is to the lowest of the low that this miracle was revealed to. Now let's step back and let's look at Mary because there are some things that we need to learn here. Mary said to Jesus, uh, they have no wine. Now, some theologians have postulated she said this to him because it was uh, the disciples uh, who had contributed to going through it, and he should do something. We don't know that for sure. Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? Or uh, more rightly from the Greek, what does this have to do with you and me? My hour has not yet come. Now, John would later in his gospel talk about that hour being the hour that Jesus is lifted up, where he's suspended on the cross between heaven and earth. His hour had not yet come. Mary, in perfect, perfect faith, turns to the servants and say, do whatever he tells you. And if you're paying attention you will realize, though well, this isn't the last time we see Mary in the gospel. It's the last thing we hear from her. So a powerful, powerful message to my Roman Catholic friends. The last documented thing that we have that Mary said in this gospel is do whatever he says. What a powerful, powerful message from the mother of God, the great Theotokos, the God-bearer, the mother of God. The Blessed Virgin Mary, oh, in perfect faith. Jesus said, hey, this has nothing to do with you or me. My time has not yet come. And Mary just leaves it there. She said her piece. She laid it at the feet of Christ. And she trusted that he would do with it, with her petition, what he would. That we should, with all boldness and confidence, bring our requests to God, as it would later say in one of the epistles. And that's what she does. Now, these water jars, these, these water jars, they're for Jewish purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. How many did it say there were? Six. Six of them. Filled with water to the brim. It's a lot of wine. Now, uh, weddings in the first century went for a long time, and so it's not... A grotesque amount when you think about how long the wedding celebration was going on or you think about the number of people that might have been invited. And Jesus certainly isn't encouraging drunkenness. But he turned the water into wine. Oinos in the Greek. And what I remember from my studies of Greek back in my days at Concordia, oinos literally only means wine. It means fermented fruit of the vine. There was an alcohol content to it. Now remember... That wine, from the psalm, the namesake of this podcast, wine was given to make glad the heart of man. Jesus created water into wine, turned water into wine, miraculously, quietly, humbly, but with all authority over heaven and earth. He turned it into wine and gave it to make glad the hearts of those at the wedding feast. Now, let's, mass, let's pass forward in time here. That wedding feast, the wedding at Cana, or that great marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom. The foreshadowing of which, as we confess every Sunday in the divine service, the Mass, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist. The foreshadowing of that great feast, or the foretaste of the feast to come. That wine that Jesus gave at Passover. And he said, this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Now, if the words given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins attached to that wine do not make glad the heart of man, what words can? Take this bread, 
This is my body. Eat it. This is given for you. Take this cup. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And then those great words from the pastor, depart in peace. Your sins are forgiven you. Why? Because Jesus says so. Now, I know that there are Protestants who just think that it's a symbol. And look, I'm sorry, but is means is and only ever means is. There's no literary linguistic reason where is ever means anything other than is even in an analogy. Is means is. If I were to say Jesus is the door, I'm not saying Jesus is a door, literally. The figure of speech is on door. Jesus truly is to us what a door is. He is the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but by him. Jesus is the door, and he says as much of himself, I am the door. So the, the uh, symbol isn't on the word is. Is means is, even in, in an analogy. So Jesus said, this is my blood. And I totally lost my train of thought. <laughs> <laughs> I was going somewhere with that, and I sidetracked myself. I chased that rabbit. So the, 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 the marriage feast of the Lamb and his kingdom, this wedding at Cana, this first miracle, a foreshadowing of all of eternity, this one miracle in time, the first, the first sign, John calls it, the foreshadowing of all of eternity in the new heaven, in the new earth, at the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, where the wine will be given to eternally make glad the heart of man, as is the Eucharistic wine. Now, some of you might be from a tradition where you drink grape juice uh, at the Lord's Supper. You need to know that that tradition only came about since the invention, I'm not kidding, of Welch's grape juice. You can call up the Welch's company, speak to one of their phone reps at their call center, and they will tell you this, that Welch's was invented because Welch's thought it was scandalous that Christians were consuming wine during the Lord's Supper. But if Welch's had only read that wine was given to make glad the hearts of men, and he looked at that truth of God's word and compared it with all of the times the word says not to get drunk. He could come to a very holistic conclusion. Wine is given to make glad the heart of man, but I am not to abuse this gift of God. And we can see, going back to the people at Corinth, they certainly did abuse that gift. Beautiful, beautiful gift, didn't they? They drank so much wine during the Lord's Supper that they were getting loaded. They were getting drunk. A gift of God can be abused, but that doesn't mean the gift of God that he originally gave isn't good. And I just remembered my tangent. Now, if you come from a denomination that cannot believe that God would attach a promise to a physical object, especially a fruit I draw you back to the book of Genesis, where God attached a promise to the fruit of the tree of life, that if they would eat that fruit, they would never die. What poured from Christ's side on Calvary blood and water is the fruit of the cross, the water into the font where we are buried with him into his death by baptism, the blood into the chalice, the wine that is given to make glad the heart of man that is his blood. All of this, all of this from the narrative of the wedding at Cana for those who take their faith seriously enough to really dive deep. This is a beautiful, beautiful gospel message here in the wedding at Cana narrative. It's not just a fun, fantastic story. It really happened in human history. God stepped down into time and space wrapped in our mortal coil and still changed instantly water into wine. Scientists have tried to postulate what would happen if that were what energy it would take and it would destroy the whole universe to instantaneously turn water into wine. And Christ as God in human flesh does this so passively. Just fill the jars. Just bring a cup to the master of the party. Jesus truly is, as the master of that wedding said, saving the best wine for last. 
He is saving that wine at his marriage feast in his kingdom for his children whom he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light. Those who have been buried with him into his death, cleansed by his blood and raised by the power of his resurrection. They will stand in the new Jerusalem and the new heaven and the new earth and they will drink the wine that truly makes glad the heart of men. And in that perfect kingdom, there will be no drunkenness. There will be no abuse of the gifts. I'm Ryan, and this is Lutheran Lemonade. Join us next week when we talk about Todd Friel's take on Aaron Rodgers and was he ever a Christian. Thank you so much for tuning in, and until next time, God's richest blessings.